I want to share with you this morning on the church. In the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 11, we find these words. They overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. How did they overcome? How does the church overcome today? The same way. Through the blood of the Lamb. Through the blood of Christ. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Not only did they overcome by the blood of the Lamb, but they overcame by the word of their testimony. How's your testimony this morning? Do you love God with all of your heart? Are you telling people that you love God? Are you sharing your faith with others? They overcame. How do we overcome? By our testimony. Thirdly, by death. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. I'm going to talk about something this morning that's not real popular. In fact, if I had my rathers, I would rather not even preach this message this morning. But I feel it's what God has laid upon my heart. I love the church. How about you? I love the church. I love the church so much that I'm, I'm giving my life to the church. I love the church so much that I'm willing to serve the church. I know that God's called. And I thank God for the call He's placed upon my life. To serve the church. And I plan on doing it. As long as God gives me that strength and that ability to do it. And I count it a privilege to serve the church. However, if it was not for the call, I would not be serving in this capacity that I am today. All of us. We're not all called as, as a, perhaps a pastor to get up and to, to preach a sermon, but all of us are called to serve the church. We've all been chosen by God to serve the church. Are you serving the church today? And in what capacity are you serving the church? As a Christian, we're a family. We are a family. We are of one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says that, they are, that we are one body. And one part, when one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. You and I who call ourselves Christians this morning, make up the church. We make up the church. But the church is just not the four walls of this sanctuary. The church goes out to other churches in this community and goes beyond this community to other communities. Not only to this nation, but the church goes around the world. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we care about the church as a whole around the world? How much thought do you give to your brothers and sisters on the other side of the world? How much thought do you give to those who are suffering today for the cause of Christ? The Word of God says 
When one part suffers, every part suffers. Our brothers and sisters in Christ and other parts of this great world of ours are suffering today because of their faith, because of their stand. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? You see, the church, the church is God's idea. It's not man's idea. It's God's idea. In Matthew's Gospel, we read that Simon Peter was the first person to openly acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. And, and that Jesus, seeing God's hand in this acknowledgement, called Peter a rock on which he would build his church. And the church that even the gates of hell would not be able to defeat. I want to tell you something. God's church is going to be around for a long time. Well, let me just say, God's church is going to be around for as long as God allows it to be around. You see, God's will, or God will have a presence in the world. God will have a presence in the world. He created it. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God created it. He chose to work through His church. The church is the strongest institution in the world. He empowers and He works through His servants to do amazing things. And miracles are still happening in our world today. Because God hasn't changed. You see, He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God loves His church so much. And He's going to keep it going. The point is, God keeps His church moving. And God keeps His church going. And God keeps His church alive in many different ways. There are times when God blesses His church. And we've been on that tail end of blessings as a nation. We've seen the hand of God time and time again bless His church in the United States of America. You and I have experienced some, some great privileges. You and I can come to church like we did today, without any fear of somebody coming in and shutting us down or taking our lives or persecution. God has blessed us, and there's no denying that. I woke up this morning and got dressed, never giving it a thought or fear that somehow my service this morning is going to be disrupted. So God moves and works through His blessings. But God also moves and works through the church through persecution. God's church is alive and well. You know, I find it to be amazing, we in America, who have been so blessed and have so many privileges and so many opportunities and can stand behind a sacred desk like this and proclaim the Word of God without fear. And yet, our churches are not packed. And we've got neighbors that slept in, and some may still be in bed today or at least right now, and give no thought to coming to church. And yet in other parts of our world, we have people that long to come to church and go to church with the fear of being found out or being seen and facing persecution. And yet they still go. 
they still go. And the church in some of those parts of our world are growing in unbelievable ways. And God is doing unbelievable miracles. And hearts are getting saved. And believers are getting sanctified. And God is working and moving in those lives. I don't know about you, but I long, I long to see God working and moving again. Hey, I've seen it in the past. I've seen what God can do. I've seen what happens when God comes. When was the last time you've really seen the presence and the power and the anointing of the Almighty on our services? I've been in services where the preacher didn't even have to preach because God showed up. I've been in services where the altars were packed with people praying and crying and seeking God. I've been in services where God's presence was so real you were, you were almost afraid to move. I don't know about you, but I long to see it again. I long to feel it again. But we call ourselves blessed. And yet, somehow we, we're missing something. And I'm afraid we're too busy playing church. We're too busy playing church. God's church will be persecuted by the world and all the powers of hell. Do you realize that in more than 40 nations around the world today, Christians are being persecuted for their faith? And should we be surprised? Should we be surprised if persecution comes to America? If you've been keeping up with any of the news, it's starting. It's starting. There's talk about censoring pastors on what they preach. There's talk about religious persecution coming. There's talk about making ministers perform gay marriage ceremonies. Listen to me, church. We better wake up because it's coming. It's coming. We can hide our heads in the sand if we want. We could say that, hey, we've been blessed as a nation and we've got liberties and we've got freedoms, but if we don't begin to wake up and take our stand, we're going to lose them. We're going to lose them. Nations in the past have. Our role in the persecuted church, both abroad and in the United States, we are to be a voice for the voiceless. In the book of Psalms 82, verse 3, it says this, Stand up. Stand up for those who are weak and for those whose fathers have died. See to it that those who are poor and those who have beaten are beaten down and treated unfairly. We are called... We are called to take a stand for the persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews 13.3 says, Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Man, do we do that? Most of us don't even give it a thought. We don't even give it a thought. But people are dying daily for their faith. I want us to look briefly at God's theology for the persecuted church. The Word of God says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and that great sermon we, we know as the Sermon on the Mount, 
He shares with us what we call the Beatitudes. And, and listen to these words. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What would happen? What would happen if persecution comes to America? What would happen if we lose our freedoms and our liberties? And I don't need to tell you this morning, but there are those that are out there that want to take those freedoms and liberties away from us. Satan wants to stop the church. Satan is in war, in battle with the church. Because Satan knows that the church belongs to God. There may come a time when we need to build a hedge around, ours, around us. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Hey, listen to me, church. When persecution comes, when heartaches come, when pain comes, when suffering comes, and we all face that. We all face that. Some of you today are dealing with suffering and pain. Some of you today are dealing with issues in your lives that you may not have the answers to. We've got some that are in the hospital today. Pat, for instance, waiting for surgery, not knowing what the outcome is going to be, worried, concerned about it, and rightly so. We've got things that are going on in our lives, and we say, God, why? You know what the Word of God is telling us to do? Be still. Be still and know that He is God. You see, we need to build a hedge around us, a hedge of prayer. We need to spend time with God. We need to let God know that we are His and He is ours. And God wants to reveal Himself unto us. God wants to give you power. God wants to give you strength. God wants to give you grace. But if you are so busy running here and running there and worrying and worrying and worrying some more, how in the world can God get through? Secondly, God keeps secrets. God keeps secrets. I'm glad he does. I'm glad God doesn't tell us everything. But I want to tell you something. He knows everything. He knows everything. The word of God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen, church, we may not know what the future holds, but I'll guarantee you I know who holds the future. His ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are certainly not our thoughts. There are times when I've said, God, why don't you do it this way? God, what about this? Or God, what about that? And He's been silent. And I think there are times when God wants us just to take our hands off and just step back and say, okay, God, go ahead. You do your thing. Take over. Take charge. Because I have no idea what you're doing. And isn't that what he tells us to do? Give it to me. Cast all your care upon me. Why? Because he cares for us. Give it to God. And what may, you may be dealing with right now, give it to God. Because He knows all things. Weakness is a direct path to power. Weakness is a direct path to power. An Egyptian Christian reflected on the way he was treated 
when he was converted to Christianity. And he said that in great suffering, in great suffering he learned how weak he really was. But in those moments of weakness, he realized how great God is. You see, in our moments of weakness, that's when we realize how great God is. When we put a hedge around us and we get alone with God and we begin to pour our hearts out to God and we say, God, I can't do this in my own strength and in my own ability and I give it to you. And in our moments of weakness, that's when God begins to give us the grace and God gives us the strength and God gives us the encouragement we need. It was the Apostle Paul who writes, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Fourthly, we need to become the victor instead of the victim. We need to become the victor instead of the victim. Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. See, you and I are given choices. All the time, we're given choices. Do we retaliate? Do we get even when somebody does us wrong? And I realize today there's a world out there that wants to hurt you. There's a world out there that wants to do bad against you. There is a world out there that wants to pull you down to their level. But listen to me, church. God wants us not to live like the world. But he wants us to live above it. And God is saying to us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus said, love your enemies. Wow. Love your enemies. Those who do you wrong, love them. Tonight we're studying... We're doing our, our last and our disciples, and we're, and we're going to look at uh, Judas. And uh, <clears throat> in reading about it, was reminded of what Judas did when he went and betrayed Christ. Betrayed him with a kiss. Everyone thought it was a kiss of love. Of course, Jesus knew it wasn't. Judas knew it wasn't. But I want you to notice what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, okay, you dirty dog. He didn't call them names. He didn't get even. You know what Jesus said to Judas? And I would imagine Judas went to his death thinking about the last word that Jesus said to him. He said, friend, friend. Jesus called his enemy a friend. Hey, what do you call your enemies? What do you call your enemies? I've heard people say names to people that really weren't even their enemies. They just didn't particularly care for them. And they've called them nasty names. You know, when persecution comes, when suffering comes, when heartache comes, when pain comes, when our world is turned upside down, what do we do? Extreme hurt requires extreme forgiveness. Extreme hurt requires extreme forgiveness. We must forgive, church. 
You know, one of the things that I find that in the church we have so much unforgiveness. That's not what God wants. Not for the church. Not for His bride. Not for the church that He instituted. We are to represent Christ. We can't represent Him holding unforgiveness in our hearts. And this morning I ask you, is, is there unforgiveness in your heart that you're holding? Oh, you need to let it go. You need to let it go. And get it taken care of. And put it under the blood. And let God bring healing. The only way that we can get through extreme hurt is by forgiving people as Christ did. Forgive. Say, so how, can, how can we do that? It comes down to a choice. It comes down to a choice that we have to make. You know, sometimes we, I, I think we, we, we love to hold unforgiveness. Somehow we think we're getting even with somebody if we don't forgive them without realizing that with inside it's eating us up. We must forgive as Christ forgave. And then prayer. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door for miracles to happen. Don't ever stop praying. The Word of God says, draw nigh to Him and He will draw nigh to us. Hey, how are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ this morning? Are you drawing close to Him? I am convinced that God still wants to do miracles in our lives today. Do you believe that? Church, are you with me? Do you believe that? God still wants to do miracles today. And I believe God does miracles for those who live close to Him. How close are you living to God? I don't want to see a show of hands because I'm kind of afraid to see a show of hands. But I want to ask you a question. Have you spent time with God every day this past week? You've been in the Word every day this past week? Have you said your prayers every day this past week? So, Pastor, I, I certainly try, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of missed, uh, missed some. Really? How about five days this past week? Were you in the Word? Did you read your Bible? Did you read a devotional book? Did you spend time with God? What did God say? A couple of weeks ago, I, I asked you about God moments. And we were kind of, we took a couple of Sundays there and we asked if, who had a God moment this past week? Hey, did you have a God moment this past week? Where you knew that God really stepped into your world and God did something, God revealed Himself and you knew this was a God moment? You know, God, God wants to have a relationship with us. God wants to talk to us. God wants to fellowship with us. God wants to come and be a part of our world. But if we don't open our hearts, and if we don't seek Him, and if we don't say, God, come and minister unto me, and we don't take time to get into the Word, and we don't spend time praying, how in the world is God ever, ever going to come into our world and do the miracles He wants to do in our lives? Listen to me. The church is alive and well today because God is alive and well. 
I'm afraid, though. I am afraid that God, God's church in the United States is not as well as it ought to be because we're too busy playing church and we're not living it. Where are you in your relationship with God today? Despite the persecution, the church will survive until Jesus comes. God will always have his remnant. I want to be a part of that, don't you? I want to be God's servant. I want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. How about you? I want to stand on God's side no matter what. I hope that you're with me. Will you stand with me this morning? Eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you that you are a God who, who cares about us. A God who loves us so much that in the midst of whether we're being blessed or whether we're dealing with issues in our lives or even persecution in our lives, you still love us. And we may not always know your ways, and we may not always know what you're doing. And Father, we don't have to really know, but we do have to be faithful. And that's what I pray for this morning. I pray that you will help your church to be faithful in whatever their future holds in their lives. We love you today. So glad that we can call you our Father. So glad that we can put a hedge of prayer around us and we can be still and we can still know that you are God. Father, give us those God moments. Give us those moments where you come and, and you come close and you minister unto our hearts. We long to hear from heaven once again. We long to see you smile upon us. Oh God, won't you come? Won't you minister? Father, as we go our separate ways, I pray that this week will be a week of blessings. I pray that you would minister. I pray that you would use us to touch the hearts and the lives of someone else. And for all that you do for us, we'll give you the praise and the glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. You are dismissed, and may God bless.